But if you have a Bible this morning, we will come to these verses eventually. Um, Mark chapter 1 and verses 14 to 15. Mark chapter 1 and verses 14 to 15. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. Well, it's great to be gathered with you on the Lord's day as the people of God. And this morning, we'll just take a little bit of a different approach to how we come to the passage. Normally, as you know, we work through a section of, of Scripture exegetically and verse by verse, precept by precept. And, but this morning, I want to take a step back and just look at a bird's eye view of the entire Bible. And there's many different ways you could tell the story of Scripture. I once did this on a Thursday night. You could tell the story of Scripture through the story of three trees. There's the tree at the beginning, the tree of life. There's the cross in the middle, and then there's the tree of life at the end. You could tell the story through three trees. And you could also open up the scripture, starting in the Old Testament and going through to the New. And you could tell the story of God in the gospel through the covenants. God makes a covenant of redemption in eternity past. It comes to us in the covenant of grace in time. And we enjoy the blessings of the new covenant forever with him in heaven. Others have suggested you could chop up the Bible and you could call it the story of creation, fall, and redemption. And there's many different ways you could tackle the Bible and explain its overarching theme. And But this morning, I want to explore the idea with us together of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. What does it mean for our time and in eternity? What does it mean, the kingdom of God? Well, if you ever want to start telling someone the story of the Bible, the story of the Bible begins with God, doesn't it? In the beginning, not man, not his ideas, not science, not education. In the beginning, God. God was there in the beginning. He laid the foundation of the earth, and I used this quote last time. But like a fountain which is overflowing, it's not broken, it's not needing anything, but like a fountain which overflows... God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit overflowed into a creation. They overflowed, and it says that the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy when God began the construction of the earth. This is how the Bible begins, isn't it? With the triune God exploding out into creation. And you've likely read the story, you know, even if you're not a Christian and you've picked up your Gideon's Bible in your hotel. You've likely looked at the story of Genesis and the account of how the world was made. So this awesome, perfect God, he comes into time and he begins to create and it says he separates the light from the darkness on, verse one, in, on day one. The light is called day and the darkness is called night. On the second day, he began to construct the sky. He separated the waters above from the waters below and created the firmament, what we know now as the heavens. In day three, he made the land and the vegetables, all the different things which we enjoy to eat, the mountains, the hills, the grass, all those things. On day four, just as an afterthought, it says that God made the stars also. He breathed galaxies out of his lungs and this is the universe which we enjoy. We're just a speck in it. But this is what God created. He made the stars also, the sun, the moon, and the stars. They were all placed in their place and told where they could go. On day five, he made the sea creatures and the birds. All those things we enjoy eating here in Gisborne. And he told them to multiply and to fill the earth. On day six, he made the land animals. That's also good because we like to eat those. We enjoy our venison here in New Zealand, don't we? But right on day six, the pinnacle of God's creation was that God created man. It says male and female, he created them in his image. The very height of his creation. And after he'd done that, after he'd reached the pinnacle of creating mankind, on the seventh day, he entered into his Sabbath rest and sat down. 
So that's the story of creation. That's how the world began. There were 24-hour days, literally. That's what I've always believed. That's what the Bible says. And God created man and put him in the earth. It says in Psalm 115, it says, The heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to the children of man. So God has been king from all eternity, sitting on his throne. And then he creates these miniature versions of himself made in his image. Not gods in any sense that the prosperity people talk about, but they're made in his image. Vice kings, vice regents. You know, like in America, you have the president, then you have the vice president. Well, Adam and Eve were vice regents in the garden. God put them in that garden and he gave them a task there. It said, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and over every, everything that moves on the earth. And that word in the Hebrew, the Hebrew word mashal means to rule, to have dominion, to exercise authority over it. They were meant to be in charge of the entire garden particularly Adam, who was the federal head of humanity. So God places man in the garden. He gives him this amazing task to subdue and to conquer. And Eve, as a helper suitable, is created to be with Adam. And everything went good for a while, didn't it? God's people were in God's land. They were with God. And everything was fantastic. It was paradise in the garden. But what happened Well, Adam failed in his task of dominion, didn't he? What's the animal which comes to Adam? It's the snake, isn't it? Genesis chapter 3. And Adam should have simply cut the snake's head off and we'd still be enjoying paradise right now. He should have crushed his head. He should have executed judgment on the wicked serpent. But because the serpent was more crafty than any of the beasts of the fields, he tricked Eve and then she um, gave some fruit to Adam and he willfully sinned. Paradise was gone. And now instead of the perfect kingdom of God, which existed for all eternity in Father, Son, and Spirit, an ugly second kingdom popped up in the garden. It was the kingdom of darkness. Instead of bowing to God, they bowed down to the devil and they worshipped his decree. And now the terrible consequence of this is that there are now two kingdoms wasn't always this way, but now there are two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the wicked one. And the bad news for us, we're all born into the kingdom of the wicked one. We follow the prince of the power of the air, it says in the book of Ephesians. We sin just like Adam did, and we're naturally estranged from the kingdom of God. We hide our nakedness just like Adam and Eve hid in the garden. This story has still been told today, isn't it? There's still the family of God and there's still the family of the devil. Some are choosing to hide from the light. Others are choosing to come to it. So this is your tragedy right at the start of the Bible. In Genesis 3, it explains why there's sin, death, disease, all the things we struggle with in this world. The Bible gives you a proper explanation for it. But because God is a good king, because he loves his creation, he promises that he's going to send another king, a second Adam. And he's going to take care of business in the garden. He's going to destroy the serpents, just as Adam should have done in the beginning. And of course, we know that person is the Lord Jesus Christ, don't we? The head crusher, the one who will be born of the seed of the woman and will destroy the works of the devil. So that's the promise God gives. He says, my kingdom isn't gone because there's two kingdoms. It's still here. They grow alongside each other. And I'm going to send in due time my perfect king to slaughter the enemy. You turn over from Genesis chapter 3 to to Genesis chapter 4. And you see the effects of this new kingdom, don't you? It says in the scriptures that Cain was of the wicked one. He belonged to the kingdom of darkness. And what happens in Genesis 4? It's the first murder, isn't it? He kills his brother Abel because he belongs to the other kingdom. 
You get the first gangster rap in Genesis chapter 4. Look that up in your own time when, um, and you'll see it there. Everything's gone pear-shaped. Now people are killing each other. The two families are at war. It looks like God's kingdom's going to be destroyed, but God raises up another seed in Seth and Enoch. Enoch, in fact, was so godly that God took him home with him, didn't he? He said, I think we're closer to my house now. We might as well just bring you home. He didn't even enter into death. So God makes the promise to them. He makes the promise he's going to send the king. But by the time you get to chapter 6, it looks like the whole thing's come apart again. Humans have been mating with these strange angelic beings and God says, I've just seen enough of this. I'm going to start a flood. I'm going to flood the earth and start again. But the godly line continues from Noah, doesn't it? His name is Noah in Hebrew, it means peace, dove. He continues his kingdom from Noah. He builds, Noah builds the ark and God's kingdom continues whilst all the wickedness is washed away. It looks fantastic. It looks like there's a brand new start. There's not going to be two kingdoms anymore. But what happened? Even on the ark, the kingdom of darkness continued in men's hearts, didn't it? In the new, the new world, Noah's wasted. He's naked. His sons, his sons are looking at him, laughing, joking about him. Sin is very much still alive after the ark. Japheth and Shem continued the godly line, whereas Ham's line is cursed. And from the line of Ham comes the Canaanites and the Canaanite wars you see later on in the scripture. So you think, okay, it's just one person. Maybe it won't be too bad. Maybe this kingdom of darkness has received such a hit that it won't grow anymore. And what happens? You jump a little bit forward and the kingdom of darkness has advanced and they're building a tower They've come together and they said, well, we're going to make our own way to heaven. We'll show this King of Kings and Lord of Lords who's really in charge. And it says in the Bible that God had to come down to look at the tower. That's how small it was in his eyes. So God scatters them. He gives us all different languages. So now we have to worry about learning to speak different languages. And the kingdom of darkness takes another hit as the kingdom of God goes forward. But the people continue sinning. There's all kinds of things you see there in the book of Job. But God continues his promises and he finds a man known as Abraham. And he calls him to continue his kingdom work. Let me read to you the promise that God makes to Abraham. Genesis 17 and verse 4. He says, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall you be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and listen to this, and kings shall come from you. What's the line of Abraham? It's the line of kings. It's the kingdom of God being rebuilt through the priestly nation of Israel. It says, I'll establish my covenant with you and to your offspring after you. I'll give, to, I'll give the offspring to your land. He makes all these amazing promises to Israel he says, I'm going to have a kingdom of priests again to serve me. I'm going to start a new kingdom project with the nation of Israel. He says, they're going to be holy, so cut a bit of the boy's foreskins off. That's circumcision. It's everywhere in your Bible. It's saying the vessel which goes in is to be holy. It's to be set apart. It's a sacred seed for a sacred family of royal kings. But then you follow the story of Abraham, you find him lying about stuff, you find him sinning it up. And even he is subdued by sin, isn't he? His son Jacob's not much better. He tells lies, he deceives people. That's literally what the name Jacob means, deceiver, he who clutches by the heel. Jacob realizes, hey, I'm not the king that I should be. I'm not going to be the one who saves God's people. But he says, speaking in the spirit, that through the tribe of Judah, this Messiah will come. He makes the prediction of the king of kings. He won't come through the different lines. He'll come from the line of Judah. It's not Abraham. He's not the king that we need. It's not Isaac. It's not Jacob. And then you just read a little bit further on and it looks like God's forgotten his promises altogether. And the people of God are starving. There's a famine they're all struggling. They're going to die of hunger. And what does God do? He raises up Joseph, a type of the king to come. 
And you know the story of Joseph, don't you? He goes into the enemy's kingdom, right into Egypt. And he rules as a righteous king in the midst of his enemies. He makes sure the people of God have food and the godly line continues. God continues building his kingdom through Joseph. And you think perhaps Joseph is the one who's finally going to inaugurate the kingdom. But then what happens? He dies and another Pharaoh comes who doesn't know Joseph. Joseph was not the king that we needed. And so we get this other guy with a stutter, Moses. He clashes with the kingdom of darkness. He does battle with them. He leads them as a royal priesthood. It looks like they've taken back dominion when the enemies of God are slaughtered in the, in the river and their heads are crushed into the sand. It looks like Moses is now going to be the king that everybody needs. And then what happens to Moses? He gets angry, doesn't he? He bashes the rock a few too many times and God says, you're not going to be the one to lead my people into the promised land. It's not Abraham, it's not Isaac, it's not Joseph, it's not Moses. None of these people are the king that we need. Moses led the people into the wilderness and most of them died. He wasn't a good leader, shepherd or king. Things get dark again and then what happens? God raises up another, another leader, doesn't he? Another kingly figure in Joshua, the son of Nun. And Joshua is a savage, he's a fierce king. He kills the enemies of God with no mercy. He kills them all. He does exactly what God tells him to do. He, execu he executes priestly judgment just like Adam should have in the garden. He says, okay, this new um, temple land, the land of Canaan, this is where God's going to be. I'm going to flush out everyone unclean. And then you've got all those chapters of the Canaanite conquests and the slaughters, which uh, many Christians are quite ashamed of these days. But he's doing what Adam should have done. He's cleansing the garden for God's presence. And you think, man, Joshua must be it. This must be the king we've been waiting for. What happens to Joshua? He dies again. They have a habit of this, don't they? They keep dying. We need a king who can't die. Because when the king dies or the judge dies, the people go astray. Which is exactly what you find after the book of Joshua. You move into the book of Judges. We've been preaching for it for a while, so hopefully you know the tagline. It says, at that time that in, in Israel there was no king and everybody did what was right in their own eyes. There was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And that's what you see in the book of Judges, isn't there? There's some good judges who come. There's um, Shamgar, Deborah, Barak. And then there's a few bad judges like Ibzan, Gideon, and Samson who all fall into sin. Particularly Samson, you look at him, he's a mess, isn't he? He has this royal birth, he has these predictions about he's going to be the promised son. And then he can't take his eyes off the ladies. He's full of lust, he's full of greed, he's full of idolatry. And so you get to the end of the book of Judges and you think none of these guys can do it. None of them can build the kingdom of God and continue to advance it like God wants. Well, by this time, at least the people of God have clicked onto something. At this point, the people of God realize we need a righteous king. We need a true leader, one who's godly, who can deal with our enemies on the outside and the enemy of sin on the inside. A king who can save us from all our foes. But what's the problem? They don't ask God to be their king, do they? He's the only one who can fulfill the criteria. Instead, they say, we want a king like the nations. And God gives them King Saul. You know, he was tall, he was powerful, he was eloquent. It probably looked a bit like Andrew Tate, I imagine. You know, people, he was a kind of staunch guy. He looked like a king. He looked staunch, but sin ruled over him. He didn't take dominion over the land. Sin took dominion over him. Just as we saw back in Genesis 4, sin is crouching at the door. It's desirous to have you, but you must rule over it. And did Saul rule over sin? No, he didn't. He gave in to sin. He sinned against God and God stripped the kingdom from Saul. He said, you're not the man for the job. And just at that dark moment when you think, well, Israel has no king, there's no leader now, God raises up King David. He wasn't as handsome or as, as powerful as Saul, 
But he was a man after God's own heart. A man of righteousness who wrote many psalms and worshipped God in spirit and in truth. He's a type of the one to come, the shepherd boy from Bethlehem, the house of bread. The one who comes to feed his people. And at first you think, well, David's the one, isn't it? He sits on the royal throne, he's godly, he worships God, he's the sweet psalmist of Israel. This has got to be the king we're looking for. And what happens? Well, he gets a bit, a bit lazy one day, doesn't go to battle, and then he gives in to his lust. He sees Bathsheba bathing on the roof, he takes her for, his, for himself, sleeps with her, gets her pregnant, murders her husband. And God says, the sword will never depart from your house. He's not the king of peace that, peace that we need. He's not the righteous saviour which we need. He might be able to dance before the Lord in zealous worship, but he cannot lead the people into prosperity and peace. And just when you think all is lost, we get King Solomon straight after David, don't we? And his name literally means peace, doesn't it? It's from the word Shalom, Solomon. His son Solomon takes the throne and he builds the house of God. He builds this majestic temple, the most majestic temple the world has ever seen. He exercised wisdom and righteousness. He asks for God wisdom and God pours it upon him in abundance. But like his dad before him, like Samson, he had a weakness for the ladies, didn't he? And what happens at the end of, of his life? His wives lead him astray. He was not the king that Israel needed either. From there you get Rehoboam and Jeroboam. They split the kingdom in half. And now the kingdom of God is at war with itself. They're not getting rid of the pagans anymore. They're not taking dominion anymore. They're fighting each other. And what do their enemies think? They think, well, this is a good chance to take them away into exile. This is a good time to take Israel for ourselves. And because of the people's sin... Because of the people's rebellion, that's what God lets happen, isn't it? First the Assyrian exile and then the Babylonian exile after. After all the wicked kings and wicked kings and wicked kings, God says, I've had enough of your king project. I'm letting the nations carry you off to Babylon. And at this moment you think, well, now the kingdom of darkness has won, isn't it? There's no king in Israel or in Judah. The people of God are scattered. This is a massive mess. But what happens? God preserves a remnant, even in Babylon, doesn't he? There are four men's names who we know well. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God preserves the children of Israel. He preserves the kingdom of God through these men. They wouldn't bow to Babylon and they wouldn't burn in the fire when they were thrown in. God is preserving his kingdom. To the others, he sent prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and, and, and others, to warn them to return to God. But even in the midst of this chaos, God is building his kingdom. And to Daniel, he gives a vision of the future. Do you remember the vision of the statue? If you've grown up in church, you've seen a picture of this statue before with the gold, the silver, the bronze, and the iron. And God says, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in history. The kingdom of Babylon's going to fall to Medo-Persia. And the Persians are going to give way to Greece. And then Greece is going to give way to Rome. And it happened exactly as God predicted. The kingdom of darkness is in full swing. They're having a party, probably some kind of disgusting orgy. King Belshazzar's drinking wine, praising the false gods. And Daniel tells him, you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Your kingdom is going to be given to the Persians this very evening. And what happened as they were drinking the wine, as they were partying, the armies were gathering into the city and the Medes and the Persians overthrew Babylon and gave God's people permission to return home. It looks finally now like the kingdom of God is going to be built. They're back in the land. They've got a new purpose, a new heart of obedience. But it's not long until they're sinning again. They say, we don't want to finish this old temple. We'll finish our own houses with beautiful cedar. And the people's hearts drift away from God. God sends them prophet after prophet after prophet until you reach the end of the Old Testament in the book of Malachi. 
And Malachi is a savage book. It brings charges against God's people again and again and again. It says you're backslidden. You need to return to God. You need to come back to true worship. It's a singing letter in many ways, but it's also a letter full of hope. Because Malachi reminds God's people, he says, the king is coming. The Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. But who can stand when he appears? For his appearance is like the, is like the appearance of a, a fire. He's coming to cleanse his temple. He's coming to set up his kingdom. Prepare yourself or you'll be struck off with a curse. And that's how your Old Testament ends. It ends with the threat of a curse. Obey God or be cursed. And then there's 400 years of silence. Nothing. God doesn't speak. He doesn't send a prophet. 400 years of silence. Not a word. And then all of a sudden, you see this madman in the wilderness dressed in camel's hair and eating locusts and wild honey. It's John the Baptist and he's shouting there, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Clear the paths, make straight the way for the king. At least people thought he was mad, but he was shown to be the wisest and the greatest of all the prophets, wasn't it? Because he was announcing the return of the king. The voice, of course, was the voice of John the baptizer, the one sent from God to prepare the way for his coming. So he preached about it. He talked about Jesus coming. And some people probably thought, well, it's just another one of John's sermons. He gets a bit excited sometimes. We know this. And then one day he appeared, didn't he? On the scene, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one sent from God. And John said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was here in human flesh. We read about his birth in the Gospels. It was no regular, ordinary birth. It was Christ stepping down out of heaven and into time. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Born of a virgin, born under law, this one who's come to John to be baptized is the one that God has sent to save us from our sins. And what did he say when he arrived? It feels like a long time ago now, but we read it in Mark 1, didn't we? Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. And repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. He says, you know, when Jesus comes, he makes the claim, I am the second Adam. I'm the one sent to undo everything which went wrong in the garden. I am the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and you must listen to my message. What's his message? Well, it said there the gospel, didn't it? The good news, the tidings of great joy. What are those tidings? What's the gospel? Well, the gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ, the righteous one, the God-man, the one sent from heaven, has come to die on the cross for our sins, to take the punishment that you and I deserve for all the bad things which we've done. If the gospel's honest with you, it says that you are a sinner. You're a terrible sinner. You're far worse than you ever imagined you were. You've broken God's commandments and because of this, you should go to hell forever without hope of parole. But because God cares for you, because he loves you, loves you, he sent his son to be punished on the cross so that if you would believe in him, you will have eternal life. And this is the message of the king of kings. This is why we're called ambassadors as preachers. We pass on the message of the great king. Repent and believe the gospel. The kingdom of God is here right now. It's in your midst, Jesus said. It's not just some future event we talk about for a thousand years or longer. The kingdom of God is happening in your midst right now. And what did Jesus say when he arrived? He said, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, the kingdom of God has come among you. It's here now when Jesus came, he bound the strong man. He tied up the devil and stole his things. It says, doesn't it, the Son of God was manifested to destroy the works of the evil one. He's came to do what Adam couldn't do, to, to get the snake out of the garden of God's story. 
He's the second Adam. He's the one to take dominion. He's king of kings and lord of, of lords. And when we believe in him, when we come to him, we enter into his kingdom. That's how Paul describes it, isn't it? He, said, when you, he says, when you become a Christian, you transfer from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Everything is restored that Adam lost in the first place. So if you're visiting church this morning, you might think these are just a, a bunch of different people who meet in an old hall full of dust. But that's not actually true. We're a, a group of people who belong to another kingdom. We serve a new king. We have a new master. We live in a different realm to this world. And make no mistake about it, it's bigger than this little church here in Gisborne. This kingdom is spreading all over the world. It is growing and growing and growing. It's the little mustard seed which is becoming the great tree and the birds of the air are taking shade in its branches. As it says in the Old Testament, of the increase of his government and of his peace, there will be no end. The kingdom of God will grow and grow and grow right up until evil makes its final stand against Christ and there's one final battle but then the end will come. The king will return and he will save his people. He'll gather them in from the four corners of the earth. He'll say, send the angels to gather in my elect and the end will come. To those of us who loved him and waited for his appearing, he'll gather us in his arms and we'll run to him to be with him forever. But for those who've rejected him, we'll use the Bible's own language. The king will say, bring my enemies before me and slaughter them. Matthew 22. To those who've rejected him, he'll trample them like grapes in a wine press until his garments are splattered with the blood of his enemies. Bring my enemies to me and slaughter them. You can't ignore this message of the king, can you? If you reject the invitation, God says, You will never taste of the wedding feast. You'll never taste of heaven. You will not be going there unless you repent and believe the gospel, unless you come to Christ. But today the kingdom of God has not come in its fullness. It's not been manifested. We're still here in Gisborne. We're not, we're not immortal yet in that sense. We're not in the full enjoyment of it. Right now you can come to Christ and receive his forgiveness. You can meet the king on terms of peace. You can wave the white flag of surrender. So do that today while there's still time. Come to the king. This is why he sends people to preach to you out on the street in the churches, in your home. All the Christians who you know, they're passing on the message of the king. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in your way. Right now the gospel's been preached, but one day the door will be shut and the opportunity will be gone. Come to him now whilst there's still time. But for those of us who follow Christ, the very best is still to come, isn't it? Can't you wait for the dawning of the kingdom, the dawning of the new age, for all these old things to pass away and for us to be with Christ forever? How's the Bible describe it? Well, let me read you a little bit from Revelation. It says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down in the middle of the great street of the city. Who's on the throne? God and the Lamb. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit for the month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. You want two bookends for the Bible? You've got God on the throne in the beginning and God on the throne at the end. The middle just tells you how you can join him, how you can be with him in that paradise, with him, sharing in his reign. By faith alone, it's even free, isn't it? The scandal of it all. You think I'd have to tell you to do a million things to get this kingdom. It comes to you as a free gift. You know, many things you don't get for free, do you? People advertise things for free and it's not even free at all. Eternal life is a free gift. You can take it freely. 
all this and then you'll pardon your sins, you'll receive a royal pardon, you'll receive royal garments to go to heaven in. It's all here for you. But you must repent and believe the gospel. You must turn from your idols, your false gods, and put your trust in the one true God. There's only salvation in Jesus Christ. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's ask a few questions of application as we close. Well, it's been great to consider this topic of the kingdom of God, to give a big sweep of the Bible. There's much more you could say, but we've only got a certain amount of time. (laughs) This world is ruled by a king. King of kings and Lord of lords. He's in charge of everything. The events around your life, they're not random. God knows it all in advance. He is the sovereign king. And did you notice that there's two kingdoms in this world? You probably knew that already, didn't you? You probably just took a look around and think, well, these people, they follow one king. (coughs) Following God and the others, they all follow different gods. But there's only two kingdoms. The kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God. Which kingdom are you a part of this morning? Have you surrendered to the king? Have you waved the white flag of surrender and said, Lord, be merciful to me? If not, then to use that biblical language, you can only expect slaughter. Using the Bible's own words, that's what you can expect if you reject the king because he is a fierce and powerful king. The king has come. Have you responded to him? Have you asked him for mercy? It's the most important question you can ever ask, isn't it? You know, if Queen Elizabeth, well, she's dead now, isn't she? If if Charles invited you to the palace for a cup of tea, you can say, no, I don't want to go sit with him. I'm not interested in being with him. And nothing's really going to happen, is it? But to reject Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, the one who gave himself on the cross that your sins might be forgiven, is the biggest mistake a person could make. Have you you come to Christ? If not, do it today. He will receive you. Come in faith. Come empty-handed. Come and ask him about this free gift that the pastor was telling you about. Is it real or did he just make it up? Open the Bible. Have a look. Ask him. Say, I want this free gift for myself. Well, to those of you who are Christians, I trust that's that's most of us. Lift up your head because your redemption is drawing near. The end of all things is at hand. The king is coming. The wedding banquet has been prepared as we speak. All things are ready. We just wait for the king to bring us on that day. Until then, we keep pressing in with the kingdom, inviting others to join us, following the king, being the church. In that way, the kingdom of God presses forward in the world, doesn't it? Until then, we carry on on praying, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.